How's the aviation Show. challenge? Alright, I want to introduce you come on. Did y'all enjoy dinner? Yeah. yeah. It was good. All right, uh, but our next speaker is from Waynesboro, Mississippi, like we are from Mississippi. He enlisted in the Army in 1971, but his father served in Vietnam twice. He's married to Chris Kennedy. He has three boys. One is in the Army, one is in the Navy, and one works at the University of Georgia. He served 29 years and retired with the rank of Lieutenant Colonel. He served with the 11th Bravo Infantry Division and is a graduate of West Point. He now currently is an instructor at the Army Command Staff College. One fun fact is he likes riding horses. And another interesting fact is he attended school in Israel. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, please help us welcome Edwin Kennedy. Introduction for Fellow Mississippi. <laughs> How many other folks we got from Mississippi? Oh, good. My heroes. All right, we got a bunch of them. Um, well, I'm in Alabama now. I live here and this is my new home, but I had ancestors from Alabama. They moved to Mississippi. So I can claim Mississippi and Alabama. Um, thank you very much for inviting me here tonight. And I know you just finished eating supper. And there's nothing like a captive audience that can't go anywhere with a full belly. And so I'm going to try to make this as interesting as I can for you so you don't fall asleep because no one should have whiplash when we get out of here. <laughs> if you have a sharp pencil in your hand, please take it out so you don't fall on it. <laughs> We're going to start off um, talking a little bit about World War I and what the significance of the war is in a number of different aspects. So I'm going to go an inch deep and a mile wide and talk about a bunch of different things. But what we want to start off with is a short film clip just to get your mind going on what World War I was about. Because it's 100 years ago now, and uh, I was just talking to a friend about this. Summarize. Summarizing the legacy of World War I in a word is difficult, but the word I use would be paradox. Because here was a tremendous opportunity for the world to learn about some of the dangerous mistakes that helped to lead to that war. And yet what we saw over the course of the 20th century in many ways was the replication of those same errors again and again and again. What World War I gave us was this legacy of inquiry, of how to make war more effective, better, but ultimately, and with horrible consequences, much bloodier. It changed the world forever because of the Second World War and the fact that Germany was left unchecked. Germany was able to build up its armaments even though it was told as a country, you need to cut back on your navy, you need to cut back on your army, your aircraft, and so forth. And so really the legacy is that it led to a second and more costlier war. I think the legacy of the First World War for America is not only about our place in the world, but also about how America itself is transformed, and in particular, the relationship between Americans and the federal government. Coming out of the First World War, the federal government is much larger, more powerful, and everyday Americans who had experienced the draft, who had experienced food conservation, who had experienced the mobilization of their labor during the war, understood that Uncle Sam had significant powers. The world had a tremendous opportunity in 1918 to ferret out those things that were dividing people our failure to deal with those issues, to have self-determination or allow people to talk about that, certainly will be a contributing factor in Vietnam, certainly will be a contributing factor as we talk about the world today and we look at the Middle East. A lot of those problems, a lot of those issues politically that we failed to address in substantive ways in World War I continue to haunt us to this day. The, uh, 
uh, picture that you see up on the uh, screen right now is the National World War I Memorial and Museum. It's located in Kansas City, Missouri, and it was first built in 1921, and then years later, it closed for 10 years, rebuilt, and reopened in 2006. And it's a beautiful, beautiful memorial, and the museum is world class. It's one of the nicest museums that you'll see solely dedicated to World War I. So if you ever get a chance to go to Kansas City, this is a place you really ought to go to. It is a world class museum and memorial. Um, I got a chance to go there a number of times and do presentations and put out displays. And I'll show you a picture in just a moment of what one looks like. But the importance of World War I is with us today. In the video, it alluded to the fact that World War II was a direct cause of World War I being unsettled. But the important thing is, what's going on right now with our country in the Middle East comes from World War I's problems. And I'm going to show you in just a second a map of the Middle East and why that's so important and why it causes problems still today. But one of the things that we talk about with our military officers in our history classes is what we call military revolutions and revolutions in military affairs. And when we talk about military revolutions on the left of that vertical line are the major things that occur within the cultures and in, in the countries and in the nations of the world to cause what we call the revolutions in military affairs, which are to the right side of the dash vertical line. And those are things that came out of World War I that were affected by nation states, mass politics, and the industrial revolution at the end of the 19 or the 1800s, the 19th century, all coming together at the time World War I comes into being 100 years ago. And all those affected the things you see on the right, things that we are dealing with in the military today. So those are revolutions of military affairs that are a direct outcome of all the things that happened during World War I. When all these factors come together during the war, the results are those things that you see on the right electronic warfare that we're fighting right now in terms of cyber warfare. Aircraft carriers came out of the war. We didn't have them during World War I. World War II was fought in the Pacific with aircraft carriers. Very important today for the projection of our national policy and military strength. Amphibious warfare, direct result of World War I. The Marines came up with a doctrine how to fight island hopping in the Pacific, strategic bombing, obliterating cities with bombers from the air. It's never been done before, but World War I it starts, and World War II is a major contributing factor to the defeat of Germany and Japan. Submarine warfare gets its genesis. Even though it's not the first time submarines are used, it's the first time they're used in widespread warfare. Today, submarines are one of the three major legs of our defense triad because they carry nuclear weapons and are all the time at sea so that they can defend our country. And then mechanized combined arms is a result of that because what we find in World War I that horses don't do so well against machine guns. And so we start building armored vehicles in World War II that really comes to the fore. And the last horse cavalry units in the U.S. Army are finally dehorsed in 1943. Halfway through World War II, we are still using horse cavalry. But that's overcome by armored mechanized warfare, which you see down there. At the Liberty Memorial, we do programs every year to educate young people about World War I and about what America did. We only had a small part of the war. The war started in 1914 in Europe, but we didn't get involved until 1917. But our first units really did not enter combat until October 1917, and the majority of the U.S. Army didn't even arrive in time to fight until 1918. The war ends in November 1918. So we didn't have a lot to play, but we did have an important part because we sent so many soldiers to help. So what you see here is a typical doughboy 
with all his high-tech equipment of 1917, 100 years ago. And believe it or not, some of the stuff he's using is still used today, but it's changed. The gas mask we use today is a derivative of the gas mask first used in 1917. So the things that this young man would have carried in 1917 would be familiar to soldiers today. The Army used a metal mess kit for years. We just stopped issuing those to soldiers, but that mess kit was the same one that they used in World War I to eat their food with. They just did away with it. I know that makes a lot of old soldiers very sad because we like that mess kit. In April 1915, the Germans used gas for the first time in warfare against an enemy. And they used it by using ground containers because it didn't violate the law of land warfare. They had signed a number of protocols in the late 1890s that said we won't use gas in shells. So when they signed that, they said we can't send the artillery shells over with gas in it. So what they did is they put large containers on the ground and then opened the valves up when the wind blew in the right direction and they used gas against the British Army. The French were the ones that suffered the first casualties though. They missed the British, hit mainly the French lines, and so in April 1915, just over 100 years ago, gas warfare started. And it was terrible because over 1.2 million soldiers suffered the effect, either died or were severely wounded by the gas. Phosgene, chlorine, and mustard gas were the primary gases used. Mustard gas was probably one of the worst because not only if you breathed it would it burn your lungs, if it got on your skin, it would blister your skin and you would suffer terribly from all the skin wounds. Soldiers years after the war still suffered the effects and World War I veterans would be hacking or coughing and a lot of that was due to their exposure to gas. Many of them died prematurely from the effects of gas. You can see the tonnage there on the chart on the left, 68,000 tons of gas used by the Germans, 51,000 by the French and British. All the gas that we used in our shells came from the French. We didn't manufacture gas shells that were able to get to France in time. In fact, Redstone Arsenal, which is right out here in World War II, was a major manufacturing point for gas shells during World War II but we never used them during World War II, fortunately. But the gas mask you see up here is called an SBR, small box respirator, which was invented by the British for their soldiers. The first gas mask were just mesh pieces of cloth tied around the face of the soldier, impregnated with some chemicals to try to neutralize the gases. They didn't work real well, so then they issued goggles for the soldiers to wear with that piece of cloth. And then shortly thereafter, came up with this mask. But we took a lot of things from the British and French because our industry had not caught up with the war. And we were unable to make our own, so we used what the British and French had. And they issued this, this mask to their soldiers. We copied it and made it for our soldiers, the exact same mask. First time ever in U.S. Army history, we used dogs as part of the Army. The dogs had followed the armies around and been mascots, but for the first time, we started using dogs. And you see on the picture there, dogs had their own gas masks that were put on to them to prevent them from being casualties during gas attacks. We also made gas masks for horses and mules. But the effects of the gas got the dogs just as well as it would a human. The most famous dog to come out of the, the uh, war was Sergeant Stubby, the dog you see up there on the upper left. He was a terrier mixed mutt. He wandered onto the Yale University campus where the 102nd Infantry of the 26th Division was training in 1917. And the soldiers loved the dog, even though they weren't supposed to have pets by regulation. They hid the dog in their tent. And they'd sneak food to the dog. And so when it came time to go to France, they hid the dog in an overcoat, slipped him on board the ship, and it wasn't until two weeks at sea that someone found out the dog was there. And the sailors loved the dog, so no one wanted to throw him overboard, and he made it all the way to France. And Sergeant Stubby 
served in that unit as a soldier as the first dog ever in U.S. history to be officially given a rank. And he was promoted to sergeant after saving the soldiers' lives by awarding them of gas attacks. And he actually attacked a German spy and bit him in the rear end, and the soldiers had to pull him off. So he was given a medal and promoted to sergeant, first time ever. And we've had dogs in the Army ever since. In fact, we have a dog training center right out here at Redstone. But those dogs are bomb dogs or sentry dogs. But Stubby wasn't officially trained. He just went along for the ride and became famous. After the war was over, the general of the Army, General Pershing, met with Stubby. And Stubby led a pretty long and pretty good life. He died in 1928, and he's buried in a soldier marked grave at this time. First time in history we used aircraft to fight each other in war. Now going back to the revolutionary times, we had balloons used for military application, but this is the first time that you see aerial combat between two countries. And this is just about 10 years after the airplane first flies that you see this happening. So it's a major <coughs> technological leap to have aircraft flying. And a lot of the, the people that flew in these things were taking their lives in their hands because they were very poorly designed and put together. But by the end of the war, all the major belligerents had air forces, and they were fighting each other with machine guns in the airplanes, which is a pretty substantial leap for 10 years just flying nothing, a little freight up to flying aircraft. The Germans started using balloons, and a gentleman named Graf Zeppelin gave the name to the balloon, the Zeppelin. He was the progenitor of the Zeppelin company in Germany. They quickly turned this civilian application to military use, and they started bombing the British. And they would do it at night because the British couldn't see the balloons very well, so they had to come up with searchlight batteries to try to illuminate the balloons. But the, the balloons just dropped the bombs on cities. They didn't go for military targets because they didn't have the capability, the technology to pinpoint targets. So they just released the bombs over cities. And it was sort of a terror bombing tactic to try to make the British afraid of it. But the British fought back. And by the end of the war, the British were making large bombers to fight against the Germans. So that was a major change in warfare. On the interwar period, in the 1920s and 1930s, an Italian artillery officer named Guglielmo Duhay came up with air power theory that is followed even today by the militaries. And what Duhay said is, we can use airplanes to win wars by dropping bombs on the civilians, the populace, and go after their industry. So the major effect coming out of World War I, dropping bombs on cities with balloons, came to the point that Duhay said, let's make a military application by going after the enemy's industries and a civilian populace and scare them into submission and bomb their industry so they can't make war goods and we'll beat them that way. And so World War II with the massive bombings you see on Germany and Japan are largely a result of Duhay's theories that he proposed. Now wars have a tendency to cause inventors to go into full gear because necessity they start thinking, how can we take things that are made for civilian application and turn them into military products? The whole tractor company in the United States in the 1890s was making farm implements for harvesting crops. And they came up in 1908 with a tractor that used treads to cross fuel. Because what they found is the heavy steam engines that ran these would make the wheels sink into the mud. And no one wants to be in the middle of a farm field with a sunk tractor because you have to get another tractor to pull it out. So what happened is the whole tractor company came up with an idea. They said, why don't we make these treads instead of wheels that spread the weight of the vehicle? And they came up with the caterpillar tread. Well, the whole company had such a good idea, the British used it and invented the tank. So the British come up with the first tank in warfare and then the French and the Americans and Germans followed suit. So every tank that you see today owes its origins back to the Holt tractor, which was used for farming before the war. The Holt company first ran these off steam engines, are very heavy. 
They came off the lighter engine in 1911, run on gasoline. So the tanks that came during World War I were not steam driven, they were all gasoline powered. And in fact, the U.S., because we were so far behind, could not make our own tanks. We took the tanks that the British and French had, and you see here a French Renault tank that the U.S. Army used, widespread use was, was made of the, the Renault RT-17. It was a two-man tank. It had a driver and a gunner commander that stood up and operated the little turret. They either had a machine gun in it or a cannon, a 37-millimeter cannon. But you notice they have large tracks on them tread, designed by the Holt Company. And George Patton, one of our most famous World War II generals, was one of the commanders of the first tank units in France during World War I. His friend, a fellow named Dwight D. Eisenhower, later becomes president, ran the tank training school at Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. And they got to be very close friends after the war because of their interest in tanks. Now I went and looked up some neat things that came out of World War I that I thought might be of application. And I'm just going to talk about a couple of them. The Kleenex. How many of you have a Kleenex in your pocket or in a purse? This is a direct result of World War I. They were trying to find a way to make a light tissue, and they came out with this product that was named in the 1920s Kleenex. But it's a result of the testing they did in World War I to come up with a lightweight paper. And so this fiber product that we call Kleenex today is traced back to World War I. The wristwatch. How many of you have a wristwatch on? Raise your hand. Wristwatch. World War I. Men never wore a wristwatch before World War I. All gentlemen had pocket fobs, which had a little chain, and you stuck your watch in your pocket fob, and you, you pulled your watch out when you needed to tell time. But when soldiers got to the trenches, they found that it was too difficult to pull the chain out. So men started wearing wristwatches. It was considered to be a sissy thing if you wore a wristwatch before World War I as a man. Women wore them, it was okay for them. But for men to do it, you were a sissy. But in World War I, that all changed. Now men were wearing them because it was much easier to get a, a time view instead of pulling the watch out of your pocket, just looking at your wrist. Zippers, how many of you have a zipper on you right now? <laughs> Zippers came out in World War I. Before that, everything was buttoned. If you look at old clothes going back before the 1920s, everything's buttoned. But in World War I, they came out with the idea of zippers. So this goes back to the World War I period. Pilot communications, putting the microphones and headsets inside of a helmet, goes back to World War I because what they found is trying to operate the radios in the aircraft would be very difficult because the background noise in the engine would get in the microphone. But if you put it in a helmet, put the earphones inside the helmet, it was much easier to use and you got out all the noise. How many of you have heard of a U-boat? Okay, U-boat is Unterseeboot. It's German for undersea boat or U-boat. The use of U-boats during World War I heavily influenced how we fought in World War II and the way the navies developed their tactics because the Germans conducted U-boat warfare against the Allies and tried to strangle Britain to keep them from getting supplies. Very big part in warfare. It's not the first time submarines have been used. It's the first time they've been used in such, such large numbers against another belligerent. And in fact, our entry into the war is caused by the sinking of what ship? What's one of the direct things? Somebody said, Lusitania, you got the right idea. Lusitania was one of the actions that helped drive us into the war. So the German unrestricted U-boat warfare against our ships. This is a friend of mine up at Fort Leavenworth. He's a volunteer at the Liberty Memorial Museum. Um, black soldiers played a big part in the war, but because of racial segregation, they were not allowed to serve with white soldiers. Remember during the war between the states, we had the emancipation of the slave, and the U.S. Army started allowing blacks to serve, but they wouldn't let them serve with white troops. That process went on until 1948 when President Truman put out an executive order said, 
we will integrate all the Army. So what about the soldiers in World War I? The 92nd Infantry Division, 28,000 black soldiers, served on the front lines in four different infantry regiments. Now what you see here is my friend is wearing a U.S. uniform, but because of racial segregation, they were not allowed to serve with the American troops. They were sent to serve with the French Army. And when they served with the French Army, the French gave them their equipment. So he's wearing leather gear that was given to the French soldiers and a French Army helmet, which is blue color. A lot of the black soldiers were not allowed to serve in combat units, but they did serve in support units and did great work as stevedores at the docks and running the supply system behind the lines. But this is the start of integration. By World War II, it's still integrated army. In 1948, President Truman said, we will integrate whites and blacks and serve side by side together. So the 92nd Division had a long, a long history of World War II, combat history. It served segregated there, but after the war was over, it was integrated. Women had a big part to play in the Army because when four million men were called up for military duty in World War I, many of them had to leave their jobs in the factories. And if you wanted to keep the factories going, you had to have somebody to take their place. And so for the first time in U.S. history, we have the widespread use of women in factories and manufacturing. And when the war ended, many of them had to go back because the men came to take their jobs back. But this started a trend. In 1921, what happened in the U.S. for women? Right Got the right to vote. Much of this was a result of being integrated into the workforce during World War I. The Army started using women in 1901 officially. First time ever in the Medical Corps as nurses in the U.S. Army. By World War I, they were not allowed to serve in the Army proper, but they did start a service that belonged to the Signal Corps. Now, this is interesting. They needed telephone operators in France to run the signal communication. But one of the problems is that to run French telephones, what language did you have to speak? French. Guess where most of the French speakers were in the United States? Women because they taught French in college. Many of these young women were college educated, spoke French, and were able to join the Army and go work for the Signal Corps running the communication systems behind the lines in France. And they were called Hello Girls because of what they said on the phone. So people, the soldiers call up, here it's a, a girl on the phone, they say, Hello Girl, and that's how their name got started. But they began integrating women into the military, and that went further in World War II. They actually became Women Army Auxiliary Corps, which turned into Women Army Corps, where the women were integrated directly into the military. The Mideast today is a major problem. You see it in the news all the time. Guess when all these problems really started? After World War I was over. Because the Ottoman Empire, the Turks, fell apart. And all these little tribes out there wanted their piece of the pie. But guess what? They didn't have the strength to really run their country. So the French and British and other colonial powers said, we will help them. We will go there and administer these countries until they can develop their own government. And so all these European powers had their fingers in the pie, and they all had areas they were interested in in the Middle East. And the French had Syria, the Levant, the British had Palestine and Egypt, and so they went there after the war was over, and all of a sudden we have the Turkish Empire has disintegrated. How do you design countries in the Middle East? Well, when this Ottoman Empire disintegrates, they're spread over many different tribes that belong to the Arab people and different countries, the Persians that are not Arabs. All of a sudden, the people in Europe say, well, if we're going to administer this area, we need to define where we're going to be so we don't step into the French area and the British don't, or the uh, French don't step into the British area. They take out rulers and they start making lines on the map that make no sense. So we run into this problem today in Iraq. We have many different sub 
elements of Arabs there of different religious backgrounds, different tribal affiliations, but we cram them into these countries with these artificial lines, and now we're saying live together peacefully. And these are the problems we run into right now in Iraq or in Afghanistan where we're trying to enforce artificial borders that came out of World War I. All right, so how do we remember our soldiers in World War I? We had a lot of soldiers die in a very short period of time. We were really only in the war for about a year. Even though we entered in April 1917, it took us a while to mobilize, get the soldiers put into the military, and trained enough to go overseas. But if you look here, we had 36,900, almost 37,000 died in combat. As a result of combat, we had another almost 14,000 die from wounds as a result. That's a lot of people. So how do we remember these men that went off to fight? One of them is a local boy that earned the Medal of Honor. He, he's from Alabama. The 167th Infantry is an Alabama unit, very famous, and it's in the National Guard here today. It's the old 4th Alabama Infantry that was put into the U.S. Army and given a new number. And the U.S. Army's number is 167. But this young guy right here went off to France, earned the Medal of Honor, comes back as a hero. But a lot of these guys went back into their businesses, left the Army when the Army was demobilized, went from 4 million right back down to about 200,000 very quickly. That's a lot of veterans that went back out to get their jobs again. And what happened to them? Well, they went off and became good citizens. But what about the ones who died? How do we remember those? Mr. Richard Pittman is a friend of mine, or was a friend. He died in 1997. He's a World War I veteran. And he went to France, was severely wounded, almost lost his right leg, and had a crutch that he had to walk with or a cane for the rest of his life. He lived in Smith Station near Columbus, Georgia, right across the river in Alabama. He's now buried near Phoenix City in this grave right here. But no one really remembers Mr. Pittman except me. There's a little plaque on his grave that shows he had military service in World War I. But I had a lot of times talking to him about his service in the Army. He had a wonderful memory. And he had a lot of interesting stories to tell about growing up as a young man and then leaving to be in the Army during World War I. But he came back severely crippled and had to leave farming. He couldn't be a farmer anymore. He opened a general store, and he ran it until he retired in Smiths, Alabama. But a lot of these men are largely forgotten, with the exception of the ones that have the monuments built to them. Frank Buckles died just four years ago. He was our last living World War I veteran. And you see a picture of him here at the National Memorial in Kansas City, at the uh, Liberty Memorial, talking to a friend of mine Mr. Buckles was an ambulance driver in World War I, very interesting life. In World War II, he was in the Philippines as a civilian, was captured by the Japanese and, cap and kept in captivity for the entire war in Japan, where he was severely beaten and starved. But he survived that and lived to a ripe old age. But he was a national treasure. He was our last living World War I veteran. They're all gone now. And I, I remember as a young man seeing World War I veterans in the Armistice Day Parade, which became Veterans Day Parade. And a lot of those guys seemed like they were just young guys then, but uh, they're all gone. How many of you have ever heard of Sergeant York? OK, good. Those of you that haven't, I encourage you to look Sergeant York up. He's an American hero, earned the Medal of Honor, country boy from Tennessee, largely illiterate, but he was a he was not going to go fight. He wanted not to, to be in the Army because he was a conscientious objector. And there's a great movie out starring Gary Cooper, who you may not be familiar with, a very famous actor. But Gary Cooper's daughter is still alive. That's her on the stage at the Liberty Memorial Museum just a couple of years ago. And standing right next to her is one of Sergeant York's two sons. Both of them are World War II veterans. Very, very patriotic people. And I got a chance to meet them. But they're, they're going very quickly. Even our World War II veterans are leaving very quickly. You need to talk to these folks because they have tremendous experiences that they can share with you.
the Liberty Memorial was down, was actually down and out of business for about 10 years. They did a massive refurbishment on the inside, redid the museum completely. It is a state-of-the-art museum. They rededicated 10 years ago. It reopened. It is absolutely beautiful. If you go to Kansas City, go see this museum. It is a gorgeous museum. And it's a testament to all our soldiers who served in World War I. But when you enter the museum, you walk over a glass bridge. You can imagine that. That's kind of scary because you don't know how thick the glass is. But you walk over this glass bridge inside to get to the main museum. And underneath is a field full of red poppies. And the little red poppies represent a thousand soldiers who died in the war. And there are so many poppies you cannot imagine. It is just a field of poppies that you walk over. But it gives you an impression of how many people lost their lives in World War I. And most of the ones in the U.S. Army, our, our losses are minimal compared to what the British, the French, and the Germans lost, and the Russians most of all. And many of their losses were due to disease, not to combat death. Here's a way that we remember our, our veterans. This is Memorial Day in 2012 when we honored, or I'm sorry, 2010 when we honored our World War I veterans. The daughter of a Medal of Honor winner um, is there laying a wreath for her dad's memory at the Liberty Memorial. And every year we have programs there to educate the public to remember our soldiers. These are a couple of my ROTC cadets. I taught high school ROTC for several years. They volunteered. They go down there and march in the parade in World War I uniforms and help remember these young soldiers who went off 100 years ago. In Alabama, we have a number of memorials and monuments. Every little town you go to has a World War I memorial. The reason is, 74,678 Alabamans served in the war. Half of them served in France in combat. So that's a lot of soldiers. But all the little towns around Alabama have memorials. The monument you see on the right side there is called the Doughboy. 300 of those exact identical monuments were made and are around the country. So you can see that same monument in a number of different cities and towns because that was the most commonly cast memorial, the Doughboy. Unfortunately, most of those are needing repair today, and I've been to a couple of different ceremonies where they've rededicated those monuments, and we had to fix them because being out in the elements, the water freezes and cracks the metal, so now they're falling apart. So that's one of the things we're trying to do is restore these monuments so we remember our soldiers. Just about three miles from this location right here, over near the parkway is the Veterans Memorial Museum. And inside there is one of the cars donated by the country of France to every state and the District of Columbia after World War II to commemorate our service in World War I and World War II to save France. They're called Merci cars. Anybody here speak French? Ah, good. What's Merci mean? Thank you. So it's France's thank you to us. They sent these cars, and the reason they sent these cars is because they are called 40 and 8 cars. What's a 40 and 8 car? Anybody know? Forty and eight. The cars had a sign on the side of them. Yes, sir. I mean, forty feet long and eight feet cross. No, that's a very good guess. Though. Good guess. I'll give you half credit for that. <laughs> it stands for forty men or eight horses, and there's a sign in French on the side of the car that says forty men or eight horses can be transported in there. That's the bus or truck that the French used, because we didn't have a lot of motor transport, so doughboys drove around France in these cars, and they'd stick 40 soldiers standing up in those cars to go where they needed to go, or eight horses. So they're called 40 and 8. One of the few remaining cars in the United States, there's not a lot of them left, because the states that got them left them outside, and they rotted and fell apart. Some states lost them. They don't even know where their car is. But the one that Alabama was given is only a couple miles from here in the Memorial Museum. And inside of it, it has a number of displays from World War I. 
The American Legion magazine just came out. I'm a member of the American Legion. It's a uh, veterans organization. And they're talking about World War I commemorations. So this is fresh in our minds still for veterans organizations, not to forget our soldiers from World War I 100 years ago. Another organization I belong to is NAUS, National Association of Uniformed Services. It's a veterans organization, and they had an article just came out in the, the latest issue talking about the World War I memorial in Washington, D.C. It fell into disrepair and disuse because no one paid attention to it, and now they're going back and they're going to raise private funds to refurbish and make a beautiful memorial there even though the Liberty Memorial in Kansas City is the National World War I Memorial, they're going to do this one in Washington and refurbish the one that exists there already. So that people aren't forgetting about our, our sacrifices in World War I. These things continue to go on. In France, they have monuments to Americans, and if you go to these little towns where the Americans fought, you're treated like a hero. Even though you didn't serve in World War I, they love Americans because they remember the cost Americans paid to save their country. And here's the Rainbow Division Monument in Croix Rouge, France, which is where the Alabamans and the 167th Infantry fought. The Rainbow Division was formed from units all around the country. That's why they called it the Rainbow Division. It was formed from units from everywhere. And the French remembered that unit by this monument there in France. Right here in Huntsville, we have a brand new memorial right downtown. If you get a chance to go see it, it is absolutely gorgeous. Huge monument and memorial to our soldiers. And on one side are World War I soldiers, and on the other side of the memorial are soldiers in modern battle here to represent the soldiers from Iraq, Afghanistan, and fighting in the Mideast today. But the World War I soldiers are seen right here to look like they're climbing out of the trench. The models of these soldiers were actual National Guard members here in the city of Huntsville that served overseas. So the faces are the people that are really National Guard members here that have served in combat in Iraq or Afghanistan. And you see a small plaque there naming some of the people who were on the monu monument. And what the monument stands for is the courage of our soldiers in World War I. I want to close out with this poem, because this is probably the most famous poem that has been written about war in the 20th century. A young medical officer from Canada named Lieutenant Colonel McRae was serving in northern France, where he noticed all the fields were covered with red poppies. So this became a symbol of remembrance, especially for the Commonwealth countries. And he wrote this poem that you see right here called In Flanders Field. And it's a very touching poem. But Cray was later, later killed during the war. He's buried there in France, in Flanders. But where this happened, the British have a number of large monuments, and in Mons, Belgium, Every night, there's a British bugler that comes out, and he plays their version of tax. It's called the Last Post. But the people there remember what happened in World War I. It's still in their memory because their countries were devastated by the war, and they remember our veterans who served there. So if you ever get a chance to go to France and you see the American memorials, a lot of these little towns have monuments to Americans. They love Americans. They still remember what we did because their children are taught to respect what our soldiers did and that price they paid. On Memorial Day here and on Veterans Day, the VFW, Veterans of Foreign Wars and American Legion, sell little red poppies. You may see people with the red poppies on their lapel. This goes back to this tradition that was started by the Commonwealth countries, the British, Canadians, and Australians, of wearing a red poppy to represent Flanders Field. We took up that tradition. I'd like to close out and just tell you that World War I is still important to us. If you watch the news and see what's going on in the Mideast, the effects of what happened during that war with us, every time you blow your nose with a Kleenex now, think about World War I. 
<laughs> I'd like to open it up for any questions you might have. Yes, sir. Hello. Thomas. Yes, sir. So the question is, the video talks about the things that haunt us from World War I haunt us today. I think one of the things is that the fighting that's going on in the Mideast is a direct result of those lines that were arbitrarily drawn on the map with no respect to where the tribes and religious boundaries were. They just drew it because they wanted convenience to say, you take this part of the country, we'll take this. So that's one thing that's left from World War I. We're still dealing with it 100 years later. Yes, sir. Jessica, I High School. You said at the beginning of the presentation that World War II was a direct cause of World War I. I, I yeah. How do you feel World War II could have been avoided? Oh, wow. You've got about two hours I can talk to you after this? <laughs> yeah, that, World War I was unfinished business because the Germans signed an armistice. It wasn't a peace treaty, it was an armistice. They said, we're going to stop fighting. So they never saw all the root causes. In addition to that, the Allies imposed a very, very harsh requirement on the Germans to pay back. First of all, they had to admit they were responsible for the war. And that caused a lot of hard feelings with the Germans. They didn't feel they were responsible. The second thing is, we required them to pay reparations. The reparations just got finished being paid off just a few years ago. It was, we over punished the Germans and a response was they were extremely angry at their treatment which caused them to remilitarize and then go to war again in World War II. So there's a number of different factors but one of the things we learned is you can't do that to someone you defeat. And so World War II, we went in and rebuilt Germany under the Marshall Plan, and the Germans became our friends instead of our enemies. <laughs>